Hello, and welcome to Supply Chain Next. I'm your host, Richard Donaldson. Join me as we explore the ongoing evolution of supply chain, from the challenges practitioners face every day to the ongoing digital transformation of the entire value network. Yeah, no so Daniel, CSCMP good, good. We'll, this year. No CCMP. So good to have you back, right? Uh, and, and certainly checking in. And now that we're, we're kind of uh, uh, looking back here, and I can't even believe it that it's been a year and two months. But you know, how are you? I mean, first of all. You know, I'm, I'm doing great. So yeah, thank you. You sound very, great. I thank you. Thank you. It's, um, you, you know, um, the, there's so many different angles to that question right now. Yeah. It's, you know, are, are you secure? Do you have a roof over your head? Are you, you know, worried about, you know, paying the bills next month? And are you physically healthy, right? I mean, have, have you been through COVID stuff? Have you had other stuff going on? And then just emotionally, are you, right. are you keeping it together? And, and I am, I'm happy to say at least on the first two fronts, okay. we're good. Right. Um, the emotional keeping it together, man, absolute chaos. But um, what a great time for connecting with your family. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Well, it gets a little bit crazy coming into Thanksgiving week because now, you know, people's plans for traveling are kind of possibly thrown out. It all depends where you are and how you want to deal with things. Even that's kind of worked for us, though. I got to yeah. tell oh, good. you, I've got, I've got two older brothers mm -hmm. and, um, and my mom lives in South Dakota and, and oh. my brothers and I are all, all spread out around the country. And so normally this time of year, there's the fight of, you know, who gets grandma for Thanksgiving because she mm -hmm. can't be in three states at one time. So um, grandma got sick and she needed to come for some medical treatment. So we, we brought her down to stay with us last year at this time. Um, and then COVID hit and hmm. she hasn't been able to go back. So we win for Thanksgiving. We've got hey. grandma and we're not going to let anybody else come. And so it's like the perfect Thanksgiving. So a semi-forced incarceration of grandma. I don't know. If right? <laughs> I'm not sure that she feels as good about it as we do, but yeah, I mean. Right. Oh, goodness. And, 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 and so uh, also, you know, uh, uh, with that, and you are in still in North Carolina, right? Right. We're in Charlotte. In Charlotte. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, kind of also, and again, checking in on the family and all that sort of stuff too, uh, right. you know, how's it been, you know, just, you know, if you, is it, is, I mean, since COVID is everything right now, it's all yeah. resurging. I mean, it's just, you know, we'll never go away, but how's that in relation to everything that you've been okay or? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. It, it, you know, it's the, um, it's, it's a change, right? Yeah. And it, yeah. it's like any change that we go through in business or in life, it's, you know, there, there's good stuff and there's bad stuff and it, it's figuring out, you know, how do you, how do you make the most of the opportunities that it mm -hmm. presents to deal with the challenges? So um, I have for years, Richard, I, I have had this dream of reaching a point in my career where I would lose my frequent flyer status. It's a, it's a laudable goal. Have you done it? I, I will in 2021. There you go. I think a lot of people will. That's right. And, and so, um, you know, I look at that. And I just say, you know, every every year when I when I work my calendar, it's like, you know, I've got conferences that I need to go to, clients I need to meet with, talks that I need to give, and I'm always scheduling it around. You know, you, you kind of prioritize, you know, birthdays mm -hmm. and holidays, and but you know, you can't, you can't be everywhere all the time. And so right. this year it's been, I, I've been here for everything, yep. right? Yep. I, I haven't missed a thing. Well, Every parent teacher conference I've been a part of. Um, but you, you know, the, um, I, I was listening to a talk earlier today, a couple of my professors at uh, Cranfield university over in the UK mm -hmm. been studying sort of this impact of work from home. Mm -hmm. And, um, you, you know, it, it's so funny because like in 2019, you would actually not laugh if somebody said, I'm going to work from home tomorrow because I have a project and I really need to concentrate and focus on that. Right. Right. And, and how now that everybody's at home and we've got all these distractions intruding when we're trying to get work done, like in 2021, the conversation may be, 
I really need to go into the office right. work because I have to have this project that I'm going right. to concentrate on. <laughs> right, right. It, and, and, and what is that office going to look like? I think is another sort of, you know, amazing totally. question right now because that whole yeah. thing has yet to really play itself out. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, let me let me let me kind of segue a little bit into because, you know, I, I mean, all tongue in cheek and, and, and all that aside, you've obviously been busy. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I mean, we checked in about a year and two months ago, second episode. Now we're on the 19th episode here of the, of the podcast. Wow, congratulations. That's oh, thanks, awesome. man. Yeah, That's it's been fun. Awesome. It's been fun. We've been, we, I mean, just like you, you know, you keep publishing and you just never know where it's going to go. And, you know, we've been fortunate, uh, very much just like everyone else talking to really good people. And I think we've had some great conversations. So where I'm headed is you got, you got a relaunch of the book coming out. Uh, you've, you've been pumping 11 courses on LinkedIn learning. I mean, you haven't slowed down in the last year from what I can tell. So I'd, I'd just love to hear even your view of what's been going on in the last year, however you want to kind of relay that because you got a lot of stuff coming out. Sure. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about the book. Yeah. The, the, the book is Supply Chain Management for Dummies. Yep. So I, I uh, wrote the I, I wrote it originally in 2017 and I got to kind of work back on the timeline, but, but I think basically I, I spent the year of 2017 writing it. It, it published um, around thanksgiving of that year. november 29th if i have ah, it right there you go look at you. <laughs> i did my uh, research i'm, a, I'm right? ready I, I, it's not it's not stalking it's research yes, yes this is um, yeah you're right you're right you're right yeah. you're right it wasn't um, stalking i'm not stalking you daniel don't worry about it <laughs> but but uh fortunately you know the, the book has done really well and yep. and and I'm, I'm i'm delighted to see that but but you know not just because i like book sales but because I think it fills a really important gap, right? Yeah. That, that in the world of supply chain, we talk past each other all the time. There, there's just, there is so much material to cover and to understand. And most people don't have the opportunity mm -hmm. to have somebody just break it down and explain yep. it in simple terms, right? Yep. Yeah, there's a lot there and it's really complicated, but let me show you sort of what it looks like and how it works and explain the alphabet soup of acronyms. And then you go, ah, oh, I got it. And, and, and you get a totally different view on the work that you do every day, no matter where you work in the supply chain. Right. So that was my goal with the book, right? right? Was to take all of this really high level, complex stuff, cut through a lot of the marketing BS and cut through sort of the, the dense academic language and pull it down into an explanation that anybody could relate to in their own lives, in their own businesses. And it worked, right? Yep. It, 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 so, but in three years, supply chain management has changed. Yep. Um, right? I mean, there's just there. Uh, oh, no question. I would, that, that was right where I was going to go with this because there's two, yeah. there, well, there's a two part question that you're sort of leading into, and I'll lead you a little bit further or more directed. Okay. One is in the three years of time since you've published this, right? Can you, you know, because the book is intended and it does a masterful job of, as you just put it, lay out in a simple way for people who are getting into supply chain or even revisiting the foundational elements of supply chain. Because we hear consistently that, you know, foundation under, foundational understanding of supply chain has not been great, right? So you're creating a common foundation, which is awesome. So the first part of the question is, have you, as you look at the popularity of the book over the last three years, have you extrapolated anything about a trend in supply chain, meaning interest, demand, enthusiasm, new people coming into the space, right? I mean, because I would imagine you could directly correspond to your book sales with what's actually going in in supply chain. Some, some, you know, so with the data that I have, you know, um, at which a lot of it, by the way, is people reaching out to me and, yeah. and saying, hey, thanks for the book. And, you know, here's who I am and here's why I read it and here's what I got out of it. So um, it, there, there's sort of, you know, one, one market segment, one persona, mm -hmm. which are um, students, right? So mm -hmm. I, I'm in college, I'm majoring in supply chain, I'm taking a bunch of classes. And this book really helped me understand how all the pieces fit together. Okay. Right. So it's not really a study guide, but it's it's, um, you, you know, a, a little bit like in the old days, Cliff's Notes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just, that, that dates. Anybody who understands that's going to be a little exactly, bit dated. Right? Exactly. Back in the days when we had books. Right. Um, 
so so that's kind of one group which is you know I, i'm studying this and and i'm i'm having to use hard textbooks and work problems and take classes and this is sort of my personal tutor my mm -hmm. mentor that they can just break it down uh then then there's another group that are um you know either early career supply chain professionals or career transition folks yep. right who who you know have a job or are looking for a job doing some supply chain stuff and again they, they need a better understanding of the the tools the rules and the jargon mm -hmm. right just break this down for me so that i I can have a job interview and have, you know, really a meaningful discussion with, with whoever's interviewing me and understand what the role is and, or, or um, if, if I'm in the role, understand how the work that I'm doing fits into the big picture mm -hmm. and, and can affect other functions. So that's kind of the second group. Um, the third group that's been really interesting are um, managers and people leaders who are mm -hmm. buying it for their teams. So I've, I've had a couple of companies, including a couple of software companies, right, where, you know, you tend to have like a bunch of IT folks. That's really who the team is. Right. But your customers are supply chain folks. Right. And so how do you get to the place that your IT folks understand the language and understand the problems that your customers are trying to solve? And so I've, I've seen it. Um, I know of a couple of companies that when they hire somebody, there's a copy of the book sitting on their desk on day one. Huh. It's part of their onboarding packet. That's um, awesome. Right? Yeah. Uh, and, and I've seen others where they do like a book club, right? So they'll, huh. they'll get the book to the team. And then, you know, once a, once a week, they'll get together and review one of the chapters. And the whole thing is only 20 chapters long, right? right. So it gives you a chance to talk about plan, talk yeah. about source, talk, talk about make. So those are the folks that where I've really seen uptake with the first edition. And, and obviously, I kind of keep that in mind going into the second. Um, one of the groups in particular that I'll call out in terms of career transition mm -hmm. um, that I've been really pleased with are folks coming out of the military. Oh, interesting. Because I, I think, you know, I'm an old Navy guy. Yeah. Right. And, and so I've got this um, very personal appreciation for the fact that folks in the military do a lot of supply chain management work mm -hmm. and they have a completely different set of tools and language to describe what they do. Mm -hmm. And so while the experience would be very relevant for civilian roles, which would be good for employers and good for, for veterans coming out, there's this language barrier right. um, in terms of how do you translate that experience and how do you understand, you know, how you would perform those similar functions on, on uh, the civilian side. And so there's been a lot of uptake in the veteran community hmm. on the book hmm. as, as sort of that training manual for you know, getting a civilian supply chain job. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, that's great. Well, that's, that's exactly what, what, I mean, I didn't, didn't know what to expect, but that sounds exactly right. I mean, you've got a huge inflow of people coming into supply chain or revisiting their supply chain kind of foundational knowledge, and this lends very well. So let me, let me do the second part, which is where you were headed a second ago. You wrote it and, 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 and issued it uh, November 29th, 2017. You literally are almost three years and two weeks later on December 15th, you know, 2020, right. issuing the new version. What's changed? I mean, I can only imagine, you know, the differences in just three years. Yeah, so it's it's actually a lot, you know, when yeah. I when I sat down to to look through it. So, um, obviously, there there's been a lot of M and A activity in uh, the companies that do supply chain stuff and supply chain solutions. Um, and so, one of the things I had to do is go through and uh, and not not only uh, mergers and acquisitions, Acquisitions, but also just rebranding, right. right? So, I in the book, I you know, I, I in order to make it really hands-on and practical, I name names. I say like, mm -hmm. you know, if you're dealing with an ERP, you know, here are some of the top vendors. These are yep. companies you should be familiar with. Yep. Well, a lot of those companies, like I said, they they merge, they change their names. So I've updated all of that. Um, there there are uh, new things like um, supply chain control towers. Mm -hmm. Three years ago, we're in a software category, right? right? Now they are. Right. Uh, and so I added that in. Um, you know, one of the things that I didn't write about in the first edition w w was the, the category of, of a particular uh, kind of software for 
manufacturing execution systems or, or manufacturing operations management systems, MOMS. It, you know, at the time, I, it, it, I, I, it, honestly, it was probably just an oversight, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just should have done it and, and I didn't. So I've got that in there, an explanation for what those are and how they work. Mm -hmm. um, then 2020 being 2020, um, supply chain risk management is suddenly a lot more important subject for all of us to understand. So um, there, there, there's more talk about what it is, how to do it, how to implement supply chain risk management, some of the tools that are out there to help with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, 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 I've mentioned to you um, the space that Requis is in mm -hmm. with asset management right. um, was not something that I had really talked about in the first edition. And so mm -hmm. the, there is, you know, some discussion in there about how managing asset life cycles and the role that Requis can play and sort of how that ties back to um, really the financial management right. of the supply chain and make, making sure that, that you're um, understanding what's happening on the, the balance sheet and the income statement. Right, right. No. Uh, all, all very timely and, and I'm super appreciative of any mention, of course. Uh, and it's not just us, right? I mean, it's, it's a global topic that I think seems to be heating up. And actually one, one, one report, and I'll send it to you after this, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but Gartner just came out with a new Magic Quadrant two years ago. The Magic Quadrant is titled, and this is a mouthful, Multi-Enterprise Supply Chain Business Networks. Yes. I'm, I'm not kidding, right? Like yeah. that—that's the new title, and I'll—I'll I'll make it simple for them. It, it's supply chain platforms, right? That's—that's that's really what they're describing, and I think that category being new uh, is is going through the initial stages of development, right? Which we you expect. Uh, I think E2 Open, if I remember correctly, is the leader in the category up there, which sure. you know is a fine solution, but it's actually been around for a while, right? I would contend yep. that there's a lot of supply chain technologies and platforms as you are kind of intimating towards starting to show up, the investment community is going, you know, gangbusters in the supply chain. So it's, and then of course, you know, uh, COVID, you know, supply, COVID made supply chain right. top of mind for everybody, right? Uh, you know, I, I, even you did interviews talking about supply chain where I, you know, I don't think you ever would have expected to be on uh, CNBC or something like that if, if that's what it was amongst others, right? Right. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, 2020 is really the year for supply chains, right? right. I think, you know, for for so so long, we've been kind of the Rodney Dangerfield, right? Where we, we feel like we get no respect and nobody really knows what it is. And all of a sudden, you know, people can't find toilet paper right. and they hear supply chain and they're like, oh, tell me more. Right, 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 right. right, right. <laughs> supply chain. Oh, you're in it. Oh, you're Mr. Yeah. Supply Chain. No. You must know what's going on. Right. Right. So, yeah, I, so I actually, this year I, I did um, CNBC and a bunch of others, but like a live spot for Tucker Carlson and I did a recording oh. for Dr. Oz. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. It, so how, it, how it do you view that? Or, let, let, oh, yeah. Oh, I was going to jump in because I think, I think where you're going to start to interrupt, but, you know, so if you go to the Gardner, you know, report, which, you know, you're nodding your head, so I know you're familiar with, you know, how do you see that in the context of the book or kind of, you know, technologies or things that you're seeing? Because coming out of this into 2021, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gold rush in supply chain technologies right now. It's like, where do you see when you look at that spectrum? Because it's still a spectrum. And I think yeah. there's two parts to this. One is, you know, the first part of the question is just like, what are you seeing technically? And, you know, how does that shape up against Gartner's assumptions and just the world beginning to frame up this category of supply chain technology? And what will that mean? Right. That's sort of question one. Yeah. And then question two uh, is, you know, what are the things that you're seeing, you know, over the last year, six months, whatever, that, you know, are coming out of the left field in tech, you know, technology that's affecting the supply chain? What new things are happening that you're seeing? Okay. Yeah. Um, so that there's a lot there. So, um, you know, one of the, the interesting things about 2020 being such a, a, a popular or supply chain being so popular in 2020 is I think you're right. I think it's, it's really made supply chain technology a hot area for investment, mm -hmm. right? So I, my, I, I'm, I, I hear that from lots of places that, you know, venture capital, angel investment, private equity, are looking for opportunities to dump money into Big anything time. supply chain related right now. Yep. So that's awesome. Um, and, and obviously, I mean, that's, that's risk capital, right? So a mm -hmm. lot of those are going to be bad bets. 
-hmm. but a lot of them are going to throw gasoline onto the growth for the things that are ultimately going to be the winners. Yep. Right. And so that's going to accelerate uh, the change. Um, and so, um, you know, in terms of the digital transformation that we've been talking about for a long time, I think mm -hmm. 2020 is really um, uh, an inflection point. Right. Yep. I, 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 I think we're, we're moving a lot faster now. And, and I think there are some, um, you know, both economies of scale and um, kind of a critical mass effect mm -hmm. that, you know, you, 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 it, it's tough to get the first few adopters, but once you get to the place that a couple of the leaders are doing it, pretty much everybody else has to do it in order mm -hmm. to stay competitive. Right. So I think there's a pretty strong pull towards um, what I'll call supply chain process automation, mm -hmm. right? Because at the end of the day, that's, you know, all of these tools are designed to automate some combination of processes that, that are, are, are part of the supply chain. Um, so it, big, big trends, mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a time when it really seemed like um, everybody was working towards the, the, the master supply chain software solution. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, the sort of the equivalent in physics of, you know, the, the universal theory, right? right? right. That, um, and, and the assumption was it was either going to be SAP or Oracle, mm -hmm. right? Or, or both, right? Mm -hmm. You were going to have, you know, a world of SAP and Oracle, but transportation management, manufacturing resource planning, supplier relationship management was all going to be inside of one of those uh, big solutions. Um, and, you, you know, what's been interesting in the last couple of years is it, at least it seems to me like that's actually kind of busted apart. Yep. And, you know, it, now it's much more um, a, a, an environment where best of breed solutions have an opportunity to, to quickly spin up and as long as um, you know, you've got APIs that allow them to communicate well, right? As long as the integration is simple, then you can you can put together the blend mm -hmm. that fits you know best uh, for for your particular environment. Right. So I think you know for innovation, I think that's really healthy, right? right? You get that combination of uh, okay, we can get money. And if we have a good idea, we can get customers, right. Right? right? Because our thing can talk. And then, you know, the other piece that you throw into it is just we're, we're in an era of cloud, right? Yep. Yep. 10 years ago, it was really hard to convince senior leaders that they could trust having their whole organization up on the internet, right? No, right. we need servers. We need a server room. We need, and, and now that, um, having that infrastructure is just an albatross, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, may maybe those three pieces, right, that, that you've got ready access to capital, mm -hmm. you've got um, an environment where, um, frankly, I think there's some backlash against mm -hmm. monopolistic players. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then, um, you know, the, the ease of, of uh, doing things on the cloud and getting global mm -hmm. access. Right. really are driving a, a very rapid innovation and making it a super competitive um, environment mm -hmm. for, for software solutions. So I think well, that's me, cool. Yeah, and I think, I think you know, you're touching on uh, what I think is the key element to what's happening here uh, is that, you know, supply chain having been a term coined in the 60s, as we all know, and kind of we're in this sort of version 2.0. 80s. 80s, 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 sorry. So 80s, 80s, right, sorry. And not coincidentally, yeah. I think yeah. it was 83, the same year as the PC. Yeah, okay, so right around right, right. around the same time, right? So, so you're looking at, you know, 40 years or whatever, and it's yep. kind of going through its evolution now. But arguably, I don't know if supply chain ever had a technology solution. I think to your point, SAP is a quote unquote financial backend that then morphed into this sort of Frankenstein ERP concept, <laughs> you know, got co-opted into usage by supply chains because they didn't have anything else. And, and so the, the era of the sort of, you know, uh, cobbler's children in the, in the back office, you know, having to live with a financial system that was never built for supply chain, never intended to be for supply chain, but kind of got forced into it. They're jettisoning that and now opening up to real supply chain solutions. So in one sense, I, in, and I'm, I'm asking a question here, 
I kind of feel like the era of supply chain technology, even though we've had logistics, you know, and payments things before, but this is actually the dawn of a brand new technology wave in supply chain solutions that have never existed before. Yeah. Um, well, that that is a, a pretty radical view, which yeah. is what I what I expect from my friend Richard. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've got to make it controversial. And, and I'm thinking about all of my friends out there in the software world and yeah. how they would respond to you know having somebody say that uh, the solutions that exist were sort of forced on customers and and, and never really met the need. Well, I think they've I, had I think they've had to your point to where you're kind of going. Like I think there have been little pieces of it but not a comprehensive solution. No one's thought about the supply chain in totality and said, here's a, here's a method or a framework yes. with which to think of your supply chain in, in, in holistically. It is so much though, Richard. I mean, when right. you say, you know, the, you know, automate the whole supply chain. Oh, well, yeah. I, right. I, and, and where do you begin? Well, and, and so the reality is it's been, um, you know, you, you automate a piece here and a piece here and a piece here, and you get huge gains mm -hmm. in, in efficiency in each one. But but you then understand the, the trade-offs and the complexity, not just of getting them to talk to each other, but that the, there are really some hard decisions to make, right? Right, about what you should do. And um, I mean, that that has been... The, the role that humans have played is making those decisions. You know, we're trying to get to the place that, that we can delegate that decision-making authority to the machines, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, you know, you're teaching them to make decisions based on um, a, a, a training data set. Right. And um, it works as long as the environment that they're put into resembles the environment they've been trained on. Right, right. Right? But, but then you hit it. And, and, and the example that I, I love, and, and I, I started talking about this in March, is um, I, have, I know lots of folks that have um, automated forecasting engines, demand planning engines that are built around AI. Mm -hmm. And the argument being, you know, why would you have a person trying to look for seasonality and correlations between, you know, uh, product demand, and just dump it all into the AI engine mm -hmm. and let it figure out what the mm -hmm. patterns are. And consistently it's going to come back and it won't be perfect, but it's going to be more accurate than the people. Mm -hmm. Great. So that was the big thing in 2019, right? Mm -hmm. Is you give it training data, um, turn these forecasting engines loose and let them predict stock levels and, mm -hmm. and, and what we ought to uh, be manufacturing and ordering. But the, the assumption there is that the statistics from the past are an accurate representation of the probabilities of the future. Right. In 2020, that is not a valid assumption. Right. And if you're waiting for the artificial intelligence to figure out that something changed, you are always going to be behind the, the ball. Right. But if you still have a human sitting at the dials, mm -hmm. somehow, you know, uh, a, a co-operator, right? Mm -hmm. A co-driver with the AI engine to go, oh, wait a minute, global pandemic. That part of the world is getting shut down. Those ships are, are not being able to move. Demand over here is changing. Um, I, I think that's the only way to sort of rewire it fast enough mm -hmm. to get ahead of a disruptive environment. And so I think one of the big lessons out of 2020 is the technology can do amazing things, mm -hmm. but, but we need to make sure that it's not just a, a, a black box and, and like, uh, you know, Dave, the supercomputer running the ship. Right. That, right. That we are still ultimately we understand what it's doing, how it's doing it, and and we're thinking ahead and we're using our creativity and our judgment mm -hmm. to say, I know what you're going to do here, and I understand that that's wrong mm -hmm. because these things have changed. Mm -hmm. Let me figure out how to give you better information so that you can do your job, Mr. Computer, 
more effectively. Right, right, right. No, absolutely. So that, so as you, you know, kind of taking that a little bit and, and kind of looking a little bit uh, forward in kind of the roles, because now you're describing also the changing role of supply chain practitioners, right? And how now all of a sudden they have to start thinking technology first, right? It's a part of their jobs, right? Even, even at the stock level, right? Even at the, at the line, even at the delivery level, right? I mean, technology is infused into everything that we do. So how is that? And I'm going to now kind of also uh, 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 showcase a little bit also on your teaching side, but the LinkedIn learning, right? And you've got 11 or 12 courses on there. That seems to be kind of a robust platform. How is that then um, affecting that technology, that new you know, DNA of the supply chain professional? How does that affect you know, your courses and what you've been seeing there? And then you know, how do you incorporate that kind of thinking into training the next generation of supply chain professionals? Right. So I, I have always had a, as, um, a personal mantra mm -hmm. that we need to think strategically about technology. Mm -hmm. And we need to think globally about our business. Right. Doesn't matter what you're doing, right? And um, so, yes, I, I'm, I'm in the, the business of supply chain management and I'm a supply chain educator. Mm -hmm. So what is thinking uh, 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 strategically about technology in that context mean? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, exactly what, what you're saying that, you know, when I started off a, a, as an, a trainer and an educator, um, you, you do classes, right? You schedule a class, you see who signs up and shows up, you go, you know, meet face to face, spend some time teaching them some stuff, and then they go off and, and um, hope, hopefully use that. Um, and, and that was really the best that we could do. That, mm -hmm. that was the best option 20 years ago. Right. Um, but but it is um, inconvenient, expensive, mm -hmm. um, in, inefficient, right? Because people learn it at different speeds. So there are some people that um, are, are bored stiff right. <laughs> working at a, a 1.0 speed. Um, and there are some people that actually need, need to be able to slow it down, mm -hmm. right? Either because... Um, it's not their native language or they need more time to think about it and process it. And so for all of those things, you say, well, if you, if you can enable education with technology, you can reach a bigger audience. Mm -hmm. You can um, allow them to adapt it, mm -hmm. tailor it to their needs, provide it on demand, mm -hmm. right? And, and do it for a much lower cost. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think LinkedIn learning um, really is the, the leader in that space for business education right now. And, and one of the things that's amazing to me is, is how unknown it still is, right? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't even know that um, LinkedIn has this library of like 15,000 business courses, right? right? Good stuff. Right. Um, and if, if you pay the, whatever it is, 35 bucks a month for a LinkedIn premium membership, you get unlimited access to all of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, part of what's happened in 2020, by the way, and it's completely coincidental, but uh, they released two learning paths for supply chain professionals. So, so the learning path is a, a sequence of courses. The first one is called Become a Supply Chain Manager. Okay. That has about 19 hours worth of courses mm -hmm. that cover logistics and purchasing and operations management and quality, mm -hmm. um, Lean Six Sigma. Um, and some project management stuff. So really, I mean, it's, it's a 19 hour class taught by a handful of different professors who all have experience in, in industry and as teachers. And, you know, it, it's um, anybody can take it anywhere in the world when, when they're traveling, when their kids are asleep, while they're working kind of, you know, in, in between times. The, and, and the second learning path is advance your skills as a supply chain manager. And that mm -hmm. gets to things like supply chain cybersecurity and managing in a VUCA environment, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so LinkedIn has those two learning paths for for supply chain folks. I know my classes, uh, you know, just to to provide a, a sense of scale. Like when I when I teach um, at Bradley University, where I teach their Intro to Supply Chain 
courses. I'll have 15 to 20 students a semester and I'll, I'll do, you know, two classes a year. So I maybe get 30, 40 students that I reach. My LinkedIn learning classes have been taken by a million students. Oh my God. Wow. Right. So, so let me, let me, <laughs> let me phrase the question that seemingly is so self-evident, but you just described a revamping of the education supply chain. Yeah. <laughs> right? No, I, it's, right. I mean, you literally just went through the supply chain of education and how yeah. it's being upended, yeah. not because of the internet, because that's been around now for 30, 40 some odd years, but because of a pandemic that has forced this now, right? It was coming, trickling, kind of like online, online grocery shopping where, you know, it wasn't right. a big tsunami, but now that everyone's got to stay at home, it's like online education is everything now. I, I think it's it's accelerated. I, yep. I think you're exactly right. It's, you know, it was there and, and it was growing, but but this has caused an acceleration. So I'll, I'll tell you um, how I do my Bradley class, because I, I think this is kind of a, a, a cool illustration. So um, I... When I, I used to work for Caterpillar which, mm -hmm. at the headquarters in Peoria, Illinois, which is where Bradley University is. And uh, several years ago, the, there was uh, a, a group of forward thinking professors on the faculty who said we need to start a supply chain program. Mm -hmm. So um, I was working at Caterpillar and, and I helped as an advisor right, um, to, to help them figure out how to, how to structure the program, what it needed to include. And then once they got the, the program approved, they asked me to come in and teach the introductory course. Mm -hmm. So been fun, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I enjoyed doing it. I, I like being in that environment. And that, by the way, is actually the origin story for the book, Supply yeah. Chain Management for Dummies, because when I went into, when I was asked to teach that introductory course, I looked around and I didn't like any of the textbooks right. because I felt that they were all either too narrow or um, it, meaning they, they covered just a very specific function. And in general, they went too deep into that function. It wasn't mm -hmm. a, a good survey sort of a book. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I put together my own materials to, to teach it, but it was an, an in-person class. Um, fast forward to 2020, and because of COVID, they asked me to, to come back and teach, but to do it over Zoom. Mm -hmm. So my students and I are all over Zoom. Well, I had to completely rethink how to teach the class because what mm -hmm. I'd done before wouldn't work. I can't bring my students together to play the beer game. We can't sit in a lecture hall and have a conversation. But what I, what I realized is, well, I have a textbook now, right? Mm -hmm. I, I published the book that I, I wonder. So, you know, now instead of my students having to buy a hundred dollar textbook that really wasn't, um, they wouldn't use most of it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They can buy a $20 book off of Amazon, right? right? Right. That that's exactly what they need, right? right? So they're going to read every page and, and use it. And then for the lectures, um, what, what I did is, uh, you know, for this become a supply chain manager learning path on LinkedIn learning, mm -hmm. I assigned them basically one video a week. So they Ooh. go watch the lecture, what they use the LinkedIn learning as their lectures. And Ooh. then when we meet on Zoom, we talk about current events and we bring in guest speakers. And huh. I do demonstrations of using particular tools. So, um, you know, and, and it's been great this year because every week, you know, you show up in class and said, so what did you read about having to do a supply chain in the news this week? Right. right? Well, <laughs> right. you know, it's COVID vaccines yep. and it's, you know, peak for the stores and, you know, stores that are going bankrupt or, or places that are automating or changes to last mile delivery. So when we come to the classroom, we're really having these thoughtful discussions of incredibly relevant stuff, hmm. right? Um, and they've already read a chapter in the book and they've watched the videos, the, hmm. the lecture at their own pace and at right. their own time during the week. Um, so to, to your point about kind of this transformation in education, I absolutely see that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and by the way, it means, you know, instead of me Instead of the students listening to me lecture everything, mm -hmm. um, yeah, they some of the videos are mine, but they're also getting like Stephen Brown, who teaches or, or taught for many years at Arizona State. Yeah. They're getting his lectures as right. well. Right, um, right. So, and, well, that, and, so that brings up an interesting question. So that's where it's kind of headed is like when you really net out in the world, like the thought leaders, educators, kind of in supply chain, you know, you obviously are in the circle, but you know, what are we looking at? 
couple, you know, dozens of really kind of top educators. So how does this effectively bring them together so they can, you know, all kind of collaborate in whatever it is that they want to collectively teach, you know, like I, where I'm headed a little bit, one, that's a serious question, but then it just starts to, you know, you start to think about this and it's like, I don't think we've truly understood the effect that this is going to have on education over the next two, three, four, five, six years. I mean, really education is going to be rewritten in, in a, yeah. over the next five to six years, much, much like any other supply chain is going to be rewritten over the next five to six years. But this is one you live and breathe. So I'm, I'm just curious, you know, how you see that. Okay. So my definition of a supply chain, because yeah. I think that's, that's the way to, to tackle that, that question or that topic. My definition of a supply chain is it's a complex system made up of people, processes, and technologies that is engineered and managed to deliver something of value to a customer. Love it. Love so it. education is a product, Yep. right? Um, the supply chain for, for education made up of people, processes, and technology Mm -hmm. And that needs to be engineered and managed. So you're absolutely right. You can certainly think about education as a supply chain. Um, and, and, and the question is, you know, what is it that, um, or, or how do you value the outputs? How do mm -hmm. you value the product? Mm -hmm. um, I think there is tremendous value that can be delivered by researchers, by professors, by institutions, tied to um, tied to the experience, mm -hmm. right? Of mm -hmm. being on a university campus, of being surrounded by smart people who challenge your thinking mm -hmm. and and will interact with you, and and you don't mm -hmm. get that same experience watching a video, taking mm -hmm. an online course, mm -hmm. doing some questions. So that for me is, is the question that, that universities need to, to struggle with is what, how do we separate the, the content, the mm -hmm. knowledge that we're imparting from the experience, mm -hmm. right? Because the knowledge, it's not just LinkedIn learning, it's Google, it's right. YouTube. You, you, it, you, know, you can get this stuff for free mm -hmm. um, or, or really, really cheap. But the experience is um, you know, located in a particular place mm -hmm. at a particular time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's the, the, the whole you know, just fault of the thing. So... Um, in some ways, that really isn't that new of a problem. Right. You know, the, the truth is, I mean, you can, you can go to, um, you, you can go to lots of different schools and have access to the same textbook, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how do the schools charge different prices and, 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 and um, get people to pay them? they've all kind of been doing that with the experience anyway, right? Fancy gyms, nice campuses, good landscaping, mm -hmm. lot, lots of, of additional programs. But I, I think you're, you're right that it, it's, it's coming into sharper focus now yep. because the, um, the ability to access that knowledge um, in a high quality way with a, a good experience, a better yep. experience Um is becoming much more accessible, much more affordable. Um, so I, I, I do think there, there's absolutely a, a need mm -hmm. for universities, mm -hmm. um, in particular as places to create knowledge and to mm -hmm. immerse people in an environment where um, questioning and learning is, is your business, right? Because right? Right. you don't get that when you're day to day. But, but if, if, there, if the goal or if, if the, the business is just teaching classes and issuing credentials, then I think um, the competition is pretty fierce. Mm -hmm. the schools that, that, fo that, that do that as their business are likely to struggle. Yep. Yep. Well, and that is exactly where I was kind of headed. As you're kind of going through that, you started, you <laughs> I started to think about universities as just gateways to content, right? 
and and, you, and I think it's a wonderful. Well, first of all, I think your definition of supply chain is great because it's simple, it's easy, and it's accurate. People can get their arms around it. But then, secondly, also talking about the educational experience, right? So where is that? I, I have multiple paths to reach that content or that material, right? Which is the one that I'm going to choose? Do I want to do the fifty thousand dollar a year at the you know uh, uh, highly manicured <laughs> environment? Yep. Or do I want to do the 50 bucks a year, but I can do it at my own pace at home, right? In, in, yes. in whatever I choose. I'm still getting the same content and, and I may choose the experience depending on what I'm looking for, right? Um, and I think that's going to, I, I just, you know, thinking about it, I, universities are going to be, they've never had this style of competition, you know, this disruption before. Well, and let, let me throw one other that, that's very specific to supply chain right now, but yep. it could branch to other fields. So I did my master's in supply chain out at MIT um, over a decade ago. Mm -hmm. um, amazing experience, right? And that's, you know, the, the whole, you, you're just going to immerse yourself in a place where you're never the smartest person in the room right. um, because that's how you learn and grow and, yep. and, and amazing experience. Um my in in the last I think five years, that group at MIT, the the Center for Technology or for Transportation and Logistics (CTL), has launched an online supply chain program called the MITx MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's a, a series of five courses that that you take, and then when you get to the end, there's a, a final exam you can do. It is the same stuff that I learned. It mm -hmm. is the, the stuff that I went to Boston and, and you know went to class every day. I mean, when they launched it, they were literally using the same slides that I had seen as a student in the classroom. Wow. Um, they, they have since cleaned up the slides. I think they're a little bit prettier. They've invested in that and, they, and they've updated this stuff, right? Because the, the supply chain profession has grown and, and expanded. So MIT is really good about um, being out in front of, of what's happening. But, but those classes, Richard, anybody in the world, mm -hmm. anybody in the world can take for free. Right. Wow. For free. For free. That I didn't know. That's if, wow. If you want to take it and get the certificate to right. prove that you took it, right. then you got to pay like 200 bucks for each class. Still nothing. So, so for $1,200, right, for the five classes in the final exam, you can study supply chain from literally some of the world's top professors and researchers mm -hmm. and get a certificate to, to, to prove it. And, and at that point, you know, back to this question of, okay, so for the $50,000 manicured campus school, what are you offering again? And yes. how do we do this value calculation? Right. So I think for supply chain, you know, in, in the next five years, we will likely get to the place that you just say, listen, if, if you want, uh, th there are lots of jobs to go around, but if you want a, a, a job as a supply chain professional, right? So I'll say mid-level analyst, entry-level manager, it will just be an expectation that you've done the MIT MicroMasters, right? Right? I, I, why wouldn't you, right? Um, and and I think that that becomes transformative for our profession. Yes. Um, so so that's and and actually, okay, my 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 dream would be that folks go into LinkedIn Learning, take the introductory become a supply chain management courses there. As almost a prereq to the MIT mm -hmm. uh, MicroMasters program, and then when you're done with the MicroMasters, th then I mean you lay that alongside a bachelor's degree or a master's degree from you know other universities, and you've got a, a pretty strong education, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, that 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 gives you not only the the ability to perform well in you know whatever role you'd need to do today. But an understanding of the trends and the ability to um, anticipate, prepare for, stay abreast of the changes mm -hmm. in what is, you know, a rapidly evolving career. Well, you you also, I mean, you got me thinking about because um, one of the things that we talk about is the aggregate global supply chain, and and I know if you remember that one chart I had of you know 
uh, 12 trillion of procurement by the global 2000 and 189 trillion of assets that they're sitting on and you know three to seven trillion of stuff they should be selling and that all comes from 47 gigatons of, of raw materials to manage that you have to have a world's supply chain professionals group whatever talking the same talk thinking the same way to achieve that type of standardization on a global basis and what you're describing from a technology supply chain you can achieve that if everyone's kind of going from the same source. There's a lot of, I mean, there's the, really an interesting app, you know, uh, implication from what you're suggesting where people are going to be learning online from com, you know, the top places, but it's the same, you know, similar content so that everyone's kind of speak now, it doesn't matter where you are, we're all speaking the same language of the same KPIs of the same things we're going after. That's really interesting. Right. Isn't that powerful? Yes. Oh because, God. Because so, you know, so many good ideas in the supply chain fall apart either because we talk past each other, right? Mm -hmm. So, so we're using the same words to mean different things mm -hmm. or, or second, because um, we don't really understand what somebody else is saying and we don't want to look ignorant. Right. Um, or third, because we don't understand how the thing that we're trying to do actually involves a trade-off right and and the person who's or the thing the whoever's in charge of the the thing that's going to take the hit in the trade-off mm -hmm. is going to push back even if the end result would be a benefit right right right, right. and so you've got to get to the place that everybody's speaking the same language that everybody understands the concepts that everybody can recognize those trade-offs and navigate that together to come up with the optimal solution. Right, right. No, absolutely. Well, let me uh, let me let me pivot a little bit because uh, I'm I'm sitting here looking at this and it's like an hour goes by without even blinking. Right. right. <laughs> like I'm just sitting here going, God damn it! I've got it's 50 fun. other questions. I have 50 other questions I want to get into. I mean, there's so much. I mean, we didn't even touch uh, 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 circularity or we sustainability. Yeah, right. We haven't talked right? sustainability. We haven't talked blockchain. Oh, how, God. Can, how can you go for a whole hour without saying the word blockchain? Well, and I'm sitting here looking at the, well, blockchain over here, but now I'm also looking at cryptocurrencies in general, right. And, and, and the explosion they're having right now, that's a whole discussion onto itself because I would argue the concept of currency uh, is being disrupted right now as, a, as another result of COVID, even though people aren't really talking about it that way, right? Because all this contactless, contactless payment stuff leads then towards, okay, well, I don't really care what it is, right? As long as it's being paid. And now with, with PayPal picking up Bitcoin, I mean, crypto just got the gold seal of approval, uh, you know, and it's off to the races. I think Bitcoin is close to a record high and it's not even making news. Within a hair's breadth. It's, yeah. it's almost at 20,000. I mean, in fact, I'll tell you, yeah. within the next two weeks, you'll probably see it crest 20,000 and then it'll, and then you'll see a flood. And, and that's when it scares me is when yeah. it's doing that. And it, cause I remember, I mean, the last time it did, it was what, 2018. Correct. But it, I mean, it was all over the news. That's all they had talked about on well, CNBC was Bitcoin and how, now that it's happening and nobody's paying attention, it, it means maybe this is actually a real thing and not just uh, media hype. Agreed. Well, let, 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 let me, let me uh, absolutely, absolutely, right? And, and this is one of these where, again, if you start getting me wound up just like you, I'll, I'll keep going. So I want to be a little conscious about your time and <laughs> our, our time. But uh, just, just sort of in closing, you know, I mean, with everything coming out, kind of coming out of this, like how do you see 21, 2021 playing out for you and just kind of everything in general with what's going on? Because you talk about CSMP briefly, Conferences seem yeah. like now they're completely on hold till Q3, maybe next year at best, yeah. you know, from a planning. So how do, you, how do you view what's going on, you know, coming, coming for you? So, and, and, and I'll, let me just throw in the CSEMP plug because I, yeah. I love conferences. I love, you know, getting together and meeting with the group. And, you know, that, I mean, Richard, that, that was so much fun for us at yeah. the CSEMP conference in LA, yeah. right? Yeah. You hang out in the hallway and you drink coffee. And I mean, you, you get to have these crazy conversations that right. normally just, you don't, you don't have time for yep. a regular day, but, but it's, it's really how you build relationships. Yep. Um, and so I've really missed that in 2020, right? Yeah. It, it's the right thing to do. I don't blame anybody for it. It's the reality. I would love for that to come back. At, and I, I balance that against my risk management brain, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is the, well, what's the upside and, and what's the downside? And 
you know, I'm trying to figure out for 2021. Yeah, on the one hand, you know, very optimistic that, um, you know, we're making progress with vaccines, we're making progress with, um, you know, antibody treatments mm -hmm. and, and other therapeutics. The, no surprise, the more we learn about this and the more time that we have to, um, to, to execute strategies to respond to it, the, the less of an issue it's going to become, right? Sure. That's, yep. so, I mean, the, the, the problem was it surprised us. We weren't ready, knocked us back on our heels. Okay, we need some time to adapt. Um, and I, it looks like 2021 is gonna be that year. Yep. Um, I, it's, it is, I am still working under the assumption that I'm not gonna get my frequent flyer status back in 2021. Right. I, I, I'm going to, um, you know, if, if given, given um, everything that I know right now, I think um, January 2022 is probably the earliest that I'm going to plan on doing business travel. Yep. Um, and 2021, you know, if things end up being better than, than what I expect, I'll probably take advantage of it for some family travel and vacation stuff. Yep. Um, but you know what, honestly, um, while I love traveling to, to meet people and build relationships, I, I also love having the ability to stay home and do work without having to travel. Yep. Yep. And, and so in some ways, 2020 has been, you know, the best of, of all worlds because now we we've lost the the excuse or the expectation that you have to travel to get work done. Yep. Yep. Right. Everybody now now has the tools. Everybody's trained in how to use them. Um, if if you want me for a day, I don't have to lose a day on either end traveling to spend one day with you. <laughs> yep. Exactly. 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 No, that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, and I think that's forever. That's forever going to change. I mean, like so many things coming out of this, right? There's a lot of positivity that you can find in the habit changing, you know, that this pandemic has forced us to undertake um, and accelerate things that were a little bit slower, which is understandable because people are resistant to change, but it's that barrier's gone, right? So a lot, you know, we talk about education, we talk about just things, you know, business, work, offices, I mean, all that we don't, you know, that stuff's going to take its own uh, chart its own course over the next few years, right? In, in, in I think, a super positive way. It's going to be different. It's going to yep. be different. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, having having spent quite a bit of time in like WeWorks and, yep. and shared office spaces, I I don't know about that model. <laughs> no, I don't think that model survives, <laughs> you know, for a while. Yep. yep. Yeah. I, and, you know, you just... I, I think I think we we will tiptoe back into that very very slowly, but but I can see you know and, and I there are plenty of folks that are going to the office every day now, yeah. right? But yeah. but it's just it's it's different and yep. um, you know you you got to be careful and you you really got to trust that the people that you're interacting with are careful too. Yep, that's exactly right. Well, listen, hey Daniel, it's it's an, we're coming up on an hour, so I'm going to wind it there. Otherwise, it, it's never you know in, for us. <laughs> we'll have a six-hour podcast, which would be like a mini series, right. uh, but this is now turning into a series. So let me let me wind up. Thank you so much again. Congratulations on the book. Congratulations on the LinkedIn learning and everything that's been going on. You sound great. So uh, all of that's awesome. Likewise, it's great to see you, Richard. Thank you so much for having me back, and congratulations on the success success of the podcast. This is Richard Donaldson. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments about the episode or topics in supply chain you'd like us to explore, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us at supplychainnext at requis.com. And while you're at it, why not check out the Requis platform at supplychain.requis.com. Requis allows you to manage the full asset lifecycle in the cloud, collaborating with your entire value network to buy, manage, and sell your assets. Find out more at www.requis.com dot com.